Okay, we're very happy to have uh, Bartosz Chishwo back um, to give part two of his talk on satisfaction classes with the full collection scheme. Go ahead, Bartek. Right. So a very brief reminder of what happened last time, to be very brief. So we introduced a theory of compositional truth over arithmetic. Uh, this theory adds a fractionary predicate, and it says that this predicate satisfies Tarski compositional axioms for arithmetical sentences, for arithmetical formulae. Uh, and then we can ask what kind of, it does it give a stronger theory than PA itself. So as we learned for a number of times, CT minus or compositional truths by themselves don't give any new axioms. If you add full induction for the truth predicate, then you can prove that whatever is probable is true. So you can prove full reflection, which implies consistency and much more. If you add delta zero induction, you can also prove full reflection and much more. So classically, induction is delta zero induction plus full collection. So how about pure collection? Collection, just mostly for the people that will listen to the recording, says that whenever you give me a bounded set of numbers, and for each of them there exists a number such that phi of x, y holds. So this you can think of it as a function. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but you can think of it as a function defined on a bounded subset. Then you have a uniform bound on the values. So is the collection scheme for truth predicate conservative for PA? This is a question asked by K, but it's kind of a natural question. For example, I heard Kantaro Sato ask. Asked it one during after my talk. So uh, just a quick reminder: the main result of this talk is that CT plus full collection is indeed conservative over PA, uh, and the strategy is somewhat clear. Like it's obvious to it obviously would be enough to just produce an omega one like model. So a model that has length omega one but whose all initial segments are countable. And in fact, we'll do pretty much this. I will do exactly this. I mean, it's not pretty much, we'll do exactly this. So, because uh, in Omega one like model uh, expanded with any predicates, this expansion automatically satisfies collection because you take any bounded subset is countable. So its image is also countable. So it's also bounded. Uh, it will be enough to show that for any uh, for any model of PA there exists an extension and extension which is omega one like it has truth predicates satisfying CT minus. Oh, Bartek, uh, sorry, yes. can I ask at this point and maybe Laurie also will, will know something about it. So, mm -hmm. so you used omega one like model because that's. Mm -hmm sort of such, you know, it's, it's enough to prove the theorem. But if you produce an omega one like model, maybe there are some other consequences uh, other than the coll collection that it also implies. Is there anything stronger than, than collection that you can deduce from that? Laurie, do you know? Uh, or I'm saying that maybe there's uh, uh, more no, than no, just the theorem. No, no, actually not. Actually, uh -huh. actually because, because, you know, because, because if, you, if you are in a model of collection, so start with a model of CT minus plus collection mm -hmm. with a countable model of CT minus plus collection. Then it actually has an elementary end extension by collection. This mm -hmm. kind of, so you can produce those end extensions and finally you will have an Amiga one like model, right? Mm -hmm. So any theory that has collection also has an Amiga one like models. No, no, I, I, I mean that, but, but, but having, uh, having Omega one like model uh, well, maybe some something combinatorial that you get more from that. No, 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 no. Exactly the, oh, I see. So it's, it's exactly the collection, right? So I start oh, I from the so, collection. So I whatever, whatever you get more from collection is, the, oh, I see. So every consequence of having economic well, like model is contained in collection. So it's precisely, it's, it's ah. manually. It's oh, really I see. Manually. Right, right. Okay, good. Um, so in, in this theorem, is M primed an end extension? Uh, not if you really start with an arbitrary countable model, 
then not necessarily because uh, this any model of truth has to be recursively saturated. So if this is not, if not recursively saturated, so, uh, okay, so maybe less confusingly. So if this is, if this is recursively saturated, then this is an end extension. Right? So other than this, you cannot hope for this for so, because so uh, what when that is an end extension, mm -hmm. um then to answer Roman, one thing you can say is that M is a semi-regular cut, right? Right. Well, right. No, this is oh, no, no, no. If oh. if you have an omega one like cut, then it's a semi regular cut, right? Oh, that's right. right. Or, right. or even I, I think it's 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 regular and and all kinds of other things, right? Um, no, satisfies PA, right? Right. It's, it satisfies PA. It's star it's coded sets, but but here and but this construction, you will get semi regularity from the construction in in addition to omega one likeness. Right. Uh, yes. 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 They're actually, that's. That's true. That's correct. So yeah. So uh, I hope we can go further. So you, the construction will be of this. You start with arbitrary model. We will produce an omega one like extension, elementary extension. You can think of it morally. It's an extension, in which you can find the truth predicate, and hence automatically this truth predicate will satisfy full collection. May I proceed, or are there any further questions? Continue. Okay. Okay. So so let's continue. Uh, so just to remind you, the obvious strategy is such that for any model of truth predicate, you find that it's an extension simply doesn't work. It's simply not true. It's not true because uh, you can have uh, uh, you can code uh, in a model of truth. You can code a function which is from an initial segment onto the whole model, like code in the sense of defined with, with the truth predicate, in such a way that it's actually so simply definable that it will have to satisfy the same properties in every end extension, but this cannot remain both a function and onto the whole model if you don't add something to the domain, right? So this was the reason why you can't normally and extend models of city minus. But in fact, we'll show that this most, that this obstruction is essentially the only one. So the actual uh, so the actual main theorem we'll show involves this new this axiom that's actually not new, it's been considered in this context. It's the axiom of internal induction. It says if you give me a formula. Pardon? Uh, is, it was it the question or okay? So this is the axiom of internal induction, which says if you give me a formula, a code of a formula in the sense of model, if it's true about zero and it's progressive, then it holds for every element. So you can think of it that that, that way that. Every like formula taken separately satisfies induction under uh, truth predicate. So it's a very, very weak form of induction. And actually this very weak form of induction uh, can be shown. And it was actually noted already in the original paper by Kutlarski, Krajewski and Lachan that this is conservative over PA. So you can actually take this very small form of induction. So it only says that you can like do induction internally for any formula under truth predicate. Typically for any formula, this means that this um, is a get code. Yes, please. But, but so, so this T could be outside the whole formula, right? Yes, 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 yes. yes. So in particular, yeah, I, I could equally well say that. So you, so you just. 
T. He's saying T dash D is true. Right, right. So this is the same as saying, right, axioms of P are true. Right, you can rewrite it like this. So it really says PA is true, but in this uh, form, will be, this form will be kind of more useful to us. And this is also how we think about it, that on one hand, it says PA, axioms of PA are true. On the other hand, it says every formula satisfies induction. So you can really think of it as a weak form of induction, but you're absolutely right. Are there any further comments or questions? So this is just a reminder from the previous week. So I'm going a bit fast, but if you want me to stop, then please do stop. If not, then we continue. Right, so the actual theorem is this. You start with a model of internal induction of CT minus plus internal induction. So it has true predicate, which satisfies this modicum of induction. Then actually you can end extend it. which satisfies the same theory. CT minus plus internal induction is conservative. So the whole argument now looks like this. Let me remind you, you start with an arbitrary model of PA recursively saturated with a loss of generality, countable recursively saturated. So in particular, it satisfies any arithmetical theory. You endow it with a predicate that satisfies internal induction, which you can do by resplendence. By the theorem, you can end extend it. In the limit steps, you observe that an end extension in the models of true predicates is elementary in the arithmetical part, because, well, you just take a formula, just take its parameters, you say that something is true. So if M satisfies phi of A, then MT satisfies T of phi of A, then M prime T prime, just, be, but just by being an extension, satisfies T of phi of A. So by being a model with a truth predicate, it satisfies also phi of A. So actually elementarity holds. And of course, this goes both ways. Uh, on the other hand, you can check that the true theoretic axioms of CT minus plus int are pi 2 over PA, so they are preserved in the limits. So you can proceed with this construction until you reach omega 1 like model, which along the way, when you union, take the union of all the predicates, it carries a truth predicate. All right, so that's the global strategy, and we are now only going to prove this theorem. So from this theorem, almost automatically, conservativity of collection follows. Any questions at this point? Uh, I understand the countability is essential. Yes, yes, countability will be essential. So uh, in particular, I don't know, for example, whether uh, for any kappa, there exists a kappa-like model with a truth predicate. For all what I know, it might turn out that the answer is no. Mm. <laughs> right? <laughs> right, right. So for all to know, it might 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 be the case that that omega one is the only kappa such that there exists. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that will be interesting. No, 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 no. That, that's, be that's, like... that's impossible because right. I'm sorry because a model of omega one like model automatically satisfies collection, and by the argument I gave before, every model with collection has an elementary end extension. So you can keep end extending it now that you know that it exists, and now you can produce for any kappa kappa like model. I'm sorry, that was uh, mm. what was wrong with this. Mm. Right. Mm. So if it satisfies collection, if I have any model of collection, which I know I have, then I can end extend it just by. Oh uh, no, sorry. No, 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 no. No, this is only no, about kappa. Another model. classes model is not like you know. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So no, so that's that's simply not true. I'm sorry. Uh, that's only for countable models, the classical theorem. So I think it's all kind of unclear to me. Mm -hmm. So let's follow. 
Okay. Was the sorry, uh, Bartek? Was the um, conservativity of internal induction was that um, was that a, a, a part of the original uh, result from Kutlarsky, Kutlarsky, Lachlan, or is this? Yes, uh, yes, yes. They essentially at the end of the proof, there is a one paragraph line that says, and essentially modifying this argument, you can show conservativity of internal induction, and then. It has been proved when there was paper by an IAT case they also kind of reproved it. So I've, to my best knowledge, that's the first proof of that fact. Uh, when there was a cut, like sequent elimination, cut elimination, the theoretic proof of conservativity of uh, truth theory, then that's of compositional truth. Then it also covered internal induction. So yeah. Okay, so thank you. It, it was reproved every time someone Proof conservativity of city minus. Thank you. Okay. All uh, right. So as I said, we'll now from now on we'll work with satisfaction classes. So we replace T a unary predicate with a binary predicate. And we'll fit it with a formula. like in the sense of the model and a phi assignment. So you'll give it a code of a formula, a code of an assignment, and you'll ask whether the formula is satisfied via this assignment. And under some, some regularity properties which we discussed last time, you can have the following correspondence between satisfaction and truth. So a, a formula is satisfied by evaluation if and only if the sentence which you get by plugging in the numerals for the values of the valuation for the respective variables is true. And actually, you seem to need some regularity for this correspondence to hold. But we actually do have this kind of regularity. Right. Uh, so let's. Let's go to the proof, to the like slight more to this of the proof. Okay, so uh, the proof comes in two lemmas. The first lemma is uh, slicing. So suppose you start with a model of satisfaction, full satisfaction class, which satisfies internal induction. Then you can extend it to a model such that the upper model satisfies internal induction and it satisfies compositional axioms for all assignments and formulae which are whose depth is in M. So the height of the syntactic tree is in M. So for relatively small formulae and all assignments, you have compositional axioms. Moreover, and this is the part which well, actually, like, neat in the second lemma, as a assumption of the second lemma. So for any A and any function coded in the bigger model, which has as, as its domain the initial segment from 0 to A, the image of F, the values of F, which are in M, are not confinal in M. So those, so if you, Give me a function. So here is M, here is M prime. You have a function coded here, which takes values from here. This is some A. Sometimes send them up to the sky and sometimes keep them within the model. So those which are kept within the model are actually below some particular value B. So either they'll end up so you can think of it that this limit is not approached, which is classically called. There's no, there's no point in uh, defining this property, but again, this is with people in YouTube in mind. That M is semi-regular in M prime. Okay, so you will produce a model kind of 
It's almost an extension, but this uh, satisfaction predicate covers only formally from M. And this model, initial model is semi-regular into lateral model. Uh, recall that we call in the classic case of models of PA and extension, you call it conservative. <clears throat> if for any A, which you can define them in M prime with parameters from M prime, which is crucial here, you can also define this A possibly with a different formula with parameters in M. So you can define whatever is left from A in M with parameters from M. Right. Uh, are there any questions as to the maybe formulation of the of the lemma of the slicing lemma? The proof won't be too hard. Right. So the, the, but, uh, you you said that, but this is an end extension. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be semi-regular, right? <laughs> No, well, the semi-regularity wouldn't quite apply. I don't. Yeah, right, yeah. No, I, it was kind of a joke, but like I, I think I formally you could. Yeah, you you did say something right, about it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's, an, it's an extension. <laughs> right. Okay. So that's an extension, right? Of course. Uh, sorry, sorry. That's my fault. Uh, okay. So the proof, I think, will I, I think the proof will be clearer than the formula. So, so the hardest part of the lemma is to understand what it says, but it will be easier to get from the proof itself. So you start with a model. As I said, it has satisfaction class, full satisfaction class, which satisfies into linear induction, and you introduce the following sets. So S phi, you introduce it purely externally. Is the set of alphas in M such that MS or maybe such that uh, phi alpha is an S? Right, so it's just projection projection to the second uh, to the second coordinate. So in other in other words, you can think of it as a, as the set of the like in the case let's say when phi has only one free variable, this is the set of elements defined by phi. So the set of elements such that they're satisfied by phi under in the sense of the satisfaction class. Okay. Now. Notice that notice that you can expand your model with those predicates, this countable family of predicates. And notice that internal induction means exactly that this thing satisfies full induction, that this structure satisfies full induction, right? So internal induction is precisely again sticking to the one variable for for uh, for these of the argument it it really says exactly so internal induction literally says this this is of course not it full induction but on the other hand if you take any psi which involves as a phi, or maybe let's denote it like this. So if you take any psi which involves as a phi as a predicate, then really. By compositionality of the original satisfaction class, this is really the same as saying uh, this is of course a bit sloppy. What what does it mean to be what is C composed with V? I mean like 
everywhere where you would have a predicate as of phi, you plug in, or maybe denote it like this, maybe a bit less, less sloppy. You just plug in phi. Thus you get a predicate of the form as phi, which is equivalent to the first one. So call it And this again is just an instance of the internal induction. So really internal induction says that this structure is faithful induction together with compositionality. Of course, I mean, without compositionality, this wouldn't work. Are there any questions? I mean, like, uh, is, is that reasonably clear? No, this is good. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So this satisfies full induction. So by Magdalene Specker, you can find conservative elementary index tension in this language. So what what does it mean to have an index tension in this language? So you have MS five. This means that you can. For instance, preserve things like S phi of X and S psi of X, if and only if S phi and psi of X. So you kind of preserve the compositionality structure, but on the formula for M, right? There are now every formula is treated as a separate predicate. So you still have full compositionality, but only for the predicates, in, uh, only for the formulae in M. So when you kind of, oh, sorry. So when you kind of glue it back, what you get, you obtain some compositional predicate, but now only for formula which were, which are in M. And if you do some a bit more massage, which is kind of technical-ish, you can actually account for formula whose depth is in M. So, so height of the syntactic tree. So they can have large, maybe large terms, maybe large, large closed terms, large uh, variables, but you can arrange it so that you don't really care. Uh, so this proves that this predicate satisfies compositional satisfaction axioms up to the depth of M. For semi-regularity, take any A, Take a function from A to M prime. By conservativity of the extension, this set is definable in the uh, smaller model with the in the expanded smaller model, F restricted to M. This structure satisfies full induction, so the image is not confined in M, because that would be a function from an initial segment, from a part of the initial segment to the whole model, which would uh, satisfy, uh, which would violate collection in the model and S5. Mm -hmm. well, uh, so, yes? so, so when you glue things back, mm -hmm. uh, really, uh, well, could something bad happen higher up to, so, so you know, if you just do something by brute force, it's not automatically a model of C, CS minus. For all formulas in of of no 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 but, 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 okay so uh, why why is it, why, why isn't the model of CS minus uh, oh I see it's right? not it's not here yet no no it's uh, I mean like uh, M so, is a model of CS minus what 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 about M prime yeah uh, no uh, you there is absolutely no reason to think so right so how do you define S prime S prime mm -hmm. of phi alpha is defined as Oh, I see, because otherwise it's just not defined. S5, S5 of alpha, right? But uh, those S5s 
they come from M. They're like genuine new predicates. You don't, if you, if you have a formula that's not, you know, like you took a formula and you have right. a unique way to say what it, what it does in M prime. Right, right. It's, there's so, no but, way. but it has to be a formula from M, right? Otherwise, mm -hmm. you simply, you know, you simply absolutely have nowhere, nowhere to, to look for, right. right? Right. And so this is one thing. And the other thing, you, you seem to be getting much more than semi regularity. That's true. I mean, like, I, I will only need semi regularity. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, what I don't get is conservativity. So notice that M prime right. is actually, that M prime is actually not conservative over M. Mm -hmm. So this is much more than semi-regularity, but semi-regularity is the assumption I will use. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually maybe, okay, so uh, that's a lemma uh, I've been working on. So, uh, but maybe actually it's something classic from the literature. Uh, Alberta, can you remind yes. me? Um, so what you want at the end is the CS minus restricted to M. And so can you remind me does that mm -hmm. does that just mean that the 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 only phi that you are looking at are the are the ones that come from M or almost almost okay. almost 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 this means compositionality for phi such that the depth of phi is in M. So for small phi in the sense of the syntactic tree, not necessarily small in the sense of the of the like absolute size. So so how do you define this uh, S prime? The DP, DP, right? This S prime? No, no, yeah. So how, if you have a phi that is Which not, is not an, an M. Right, right. That's a bit of technical thing. So you kind of assume some regularity conditions as I said in the beginning. Sure, yeah. You kind of assume that you're Really, your your S five S S doesn't that doesn't really look at, for example, what var variables you use, and then you basically since this family of S P will satisfy those congruences also in the model M prime, then you basically extend it to all the formula or the formula with the small dev by those congruences. Okay, so. Right, because this is this is an index oh, so, okay. so, so so formula will, will won't right. get new syntactic structures. Right. So if you're saying only... that the depth is an M, then you're saying you essentially have it free of mm -hmm. whose height is in M and it's just perhaps labeled by things that are not in yes, M. Yes, yes. So I just take relabeling uh, okay. extended by this relabeling, right? Okay. Right. Um and so what makes it not be an M is perhaps terms. Um, I think or or, or big variables, right? Big so, variables, you know, okay. Like, I can have a formula of this form for all x, mm -hmm. x equals x, which is not an M because this x is some some huge new variable. Mm -hmm. But for mm -hmm. for example, in this case, I I exactly know what to do, right? There is only right. one can uh, one thing I can do by compositionality. So, for example, if phi is literally a formula from the previous model, I can look at the mod at the formula for all x phi of x, where x is huge variable. But then I simply, by congruence, I simply say, well, it's okay. It's the same as for all v, v of v, right? Mm -hmm. From the smaller model. Mm -hmm. And then I just just say that those satisfy the same assignments. And I just generally, by generalizing this process, I extend it to all form. Right. Mm -hmm. And so now... Uh, Oh, I see. So here, 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 regularity really matters. Yeah. Yes. And it will, it will also matter in the further steps of construction. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I put on to make smooth transitions between terms and uh, between uh, between uh, truth and satisfaction, but I also will use it in the further parts of the proof. So here it really matters because otherwise, you know, it was like, if it could happen that in a very pathological class that in general, uh, in this precise case, this is not so, but in general, it could happen that for example, if I have a formula and I just change one variable somewhere deep inside, this has nothing to do in general, I say. If I reinstitute variables and then I don't simply, you know, don't know what to do with new formula with new variables plugged in for fee, right? So it could happen that I have, I have small formulae 
if uh, my satisfaction class was very irregular on under a say let's say resubstitution renaming of variables and I simply don't absolutely don't know what to do with new formulae which are new resubstitutions right okay uh, my question to you uh, is as follows uh, I was thinking of this argument I think it kind of works out but it's kind of uh, something I'd prefer to just quote one lemma from the literature if that's possible so assume m countable and satisfies collection, full collection. Does M have a semi-regular and elementary end extension? I assume, I think the answer is yes. But I have to check it. I mean, like I kind of had a omitting type style construction to the effect that it does, but it's kind of well, not as... But look, the, so what do you assume about uh, the full... What, what's the base theory? What What is the full collection? Uh, over. Uh, I take... Let's say, OK, so assume you're working to the context where you have models of PA, and over them, you have some new predicates which satisfy collection, full collection. Oh, I see. Oh. But, but, but otherwise, it doesn't have to be a class, right? It's... No, 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 then, then it satisfies full induction, right? Um, no. Right. So. Okay, I, so I, I think I think the answer. I mean, like I was, that's that's something you know to, to think of. I, I was thinking that the answer is yes, and I think I have a proof. But I was thinking that maybe it's something that you know automatically follows from. I well, I don't know anything that would be sort of similar to this kind of result. I don't know, Laurie. Do you? Does it look like something that you've seen? No. Okay. 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 That's. So I think that. I think this this holds true. It's not essential for the proof, but it just allows us to weaken the assumptions we use. Okay, let's let's go further. So we're done with the first lemma, the easier one. So now this is the hard part. So you have this model of CS minus restricted to a semi-regular non-standard cut plus internal induction. So that's what we get from the previous lemma. A model which satisfies compositional clauses on the cut satisfies internal induction. And this cut is semi-regular. Uh, then you can extend it to all formulae. So you can erase this restriction to Y. So there is a way to extend it to, to the whole model. Uh, but then, yes? so, so, sorry about, for those interruptions, but so in particular, if you, if you apply it to the standard model, Mm -hmm. This will give you Kotlarski, Krajewski, Lachlan theorem. No. Why not? Explicit. Ah, sorry. <laughs> this is used in the proof. Don't, don't stand up. I see. I see now. You know, I... This is you. Uh, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> one should read. One should read statements, right? Uh, but actually, okay. So, uh, as a matter of fact, this lemma kind of uh, is actually there is a proof based on this, essentially on the same technique. So this technique is used. Is based on a technique used by Fyodor Pahomov to prove Kotlarski Krajewski Uh as you will see. So, as a matter of fact, the history of this proof was that I kind of thought that I can do away with simpler combinatorics in my case, but it turned out that I was keep, I kept going into technical troubles. I had to reconstruct the details, and then in the process of reconstructing the details, I ended up doing essentially the exact same argument that Fyodor did. So, but as a byproduct, I finally understood why the bounds in his proof appear. So <laughs> there were details of your proofs I, I could never quite understand, but I had to work them through and it turned out, it's of course, nice. I, it's nice. Yeah, of course I knew about his proof. That, that's so, so that's really, it's really something follow like a construction very much modeled after his. 
if you drop the semi-regularity assumption, it, it, yeah, because this looks odd, right? Why, why, why would you need? So I have a truth predicate for certain formulae. I want to extend it to all formulae. And notice that there are like kind of seems to be no interaction, right? This is, this I is a cap. It's closed under P8. If I have a formula here in I, then conjunction is an I. If I quantify it, it's still an I. So you can think, okay, so but in what sense can the satisfaction class of a small formula in a cut, it's close, it's upper close, right? A formula from the higher up, from, from M minus I, will actually never kind of directly see formally from I. So I, you know, how, 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 how can there be an abstraction to this kind of extension? I was thinking initially that there can be no, but it turns out that actually if you just cross out some irregularity from here, so I can extend a truth predicate from a mod, from a cut to the whole model, then it just falls, then it simply falls. Actually, for the reasons similar to Lachlan's theorem, which says that you cannot always. So in Lachlan's theorem, you show that you cannot always extend a truth predicate defining a standard cut to the full truth predicate to the model because the obstruction being recursive saturation. This theorem shows this lemma combined with the remark shows that you cannot always extend a truth predicate from a cut to the whole model, the abstraction being semi-regularity of the cut. The counterexample to the lemma is quite complicated and we won't go into it, but it was actually in the joint paper with Roman. You use a pair of models such that M prime codes a co-final increasing omega sequence. Okay. If there are no further questions, I will go, just go to the proof of the lemma. So as I said, we'll use the construction that Hyodor used in 2020 paper. In the proof, we'll make use of the notion of syntactic templates. It's kind of technical, but don't be scared. I mean, I'm... essentially all the details have been swept under the rug all ago, long ago. So a syntactic template, you think of it as a normal form. You erase all terms, you erase or non-trivial term structure, so if you see non-trivial term, you just plug in a fresh free variable there. All free variables are distinct. All bounds variables are distinct. They are chosen in some canonical way. So essentially the way I think of it is you, you give me a concrete formula and I give you a genuine syntactic tree where you kind of erase all the I needed noise because just formula just carries too much information. And you just take pure syntactic tree. This is template. So formally it's kind of some normal form of a of a formula. If you don't like, like, if you you don't have to understand the details of what template is, I know I kind of rushed through it, but it's really non-essential. So it's some kind of normal form or pure syntactic tree of the formula. You can think of it like this. So start of your model. As in Fyodor's proof, will so this is I, this is M. Here is some new formula phi. The trick will be you will kind of bring all the formulae from M down to I with a function F in a way that, let's say, if I take a conjunction, then this will be conjunction of resulting functions. So you, in a uniform manner, you bring down all the formulae from M down to I. Uh, if you do this, then it's kind of easy, right? So you have a big formula here. So here's I, here's M. You have a big formula here. You bring it down to a small formula, T. And if you're 
careful enough with what template is, we can just say, okay, so this big formula, and keep in mind that uh, I preserve syntactic structure, which means the top of the syntactic tree of f of phi is the same as the top of the syntactic tree of phi. So I just say, okay, s prime of phi is the same. I just copy paste satisfaction from i to m. So this s prime of phi is just the same as s of f of phi with literally the same alphas. I don't transpose them by any function or anything like this. This is kind of relevant because those alphas now come from the whole model. So if I would have to do something with them, this would be a catastrophe because I know what satisfaction class the satisfaction class is doing on the formulae from i and alphas from m. So I better than touch alphas, but I don't have to buy those like careful analysis of template. So I only need to find such a function. So I only need to, given a big formula, know how to bring it down to a small form. So, Vartek, so in particular, if, so if the if the template is finite, standard, mm -hmm. then then you 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 sa sample the truth on the standard part. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, but on the other hand, that, that's not right. shocking, right? What, what does right. No, what right. Does it's that, not very shocking, no. That I, I have a formula, let's say, mm -hmm. for all x, x equals x, which is non-standard for a stupid reason, right? <laughs> right, It's right. not standard because it has no standard. But yeah, I, I do bring it down to a formula, let's say. Um, actually, so, okay, so actually it's not quite true. So actually, you know, like the template of this formula, this kind of part of the point will be standard. So I will never have a non-standard formula with a non-standard template of standard mm. uh, depth. Mm -hmm. I see. But what's you know what's what's non-trivial is that maybe I have a formula phi in M without I, which is genuinely new. It has huge syntactic tree. It's very very deep. And somehow, I kind of am able to copy paste it, to copy it like almost copy it, so that if I look if I search through. Initial segments, I won't see any difference, literally. I will be kind of consistent in it. I won't change formula from the previous model, so I won't change formula from i, so this f will be identity on i. But on the other hand, I'll kind of able to do it in a uniform way. And this is small, this is an i. Okay, that's that's my that's that's the trick. That's that's what we're trying to do. That's what Fyodor did. Essentially, but Fyodor was working with a model and its and its initial segment, not the cut. We we're working with a model and its and its uh, and its cut uh, and its uh, semi regular cut. Uh, instances of induction to be an instance of induction is only a matter of what happens at the top, like five levels syntactic depth of the formula. This is where I recognize for the instance of the induction scheme. So it would also be preserved in this extension. And finally, as I said, if you define this on those canonical templates, then you, by regularity, this extends to the to whole form. I know we have five minutes, so how do we do this? How do you, do the, how do you actually do this? Uh, so you start with an enumeration of templates. And this is again a moment at which I use uh, countability. U phi is kind of like a syntactic uh, syntactic neighborhood. So those are templates. So this is huge formula phi. This is some a. We think of it as being very small. And you have some subformulae here, right? You gather all the subformulae here. You take the templates and you call this set u phi a. So whatever appears at this syntactic depth. You'll have a sequence of elements and the sequence of functions such that the nth function is defined on the neighborhood of nth formula. So the neighborhoods are getting tighter and tighter. I look at smaller and smaller neighborhoods of form. So this is phi zero, this is a zero, this is phi one, 
this is a1 and I'll keep defining them on smaller and smaller uh, sets of formulae. It's preserved syntactic structure. It's the identity function when restricted to small formulae. And now there's the agreement condition. Suppose you give me a phi n. This is a n. F n is defined here. You give me further phi k, and you give me much smaller a k. If you take the previous a k, right? And you take the intersection of those Uh, and you take the intersection of those two sets, then the function fn agrees with fk on this intersection. So there is some small sample of agreement. So you agree, notice that n is, an is much smaller than ai. So we agree not on the full domains, so there are not so those functions are allowed to disagree, but you allow you agree if you are very close to formula phi n and phi i. Suppose you manage to construct such a sequence of functions, and then you take diagonal limit. So f of phi phi is some phi n is the nth function. Now, no, notice that this f preserves syntactic operations. So suppose you have direct subformula of phi m in your final model. Then notice that take n, which is max of everything relevant, so klm. And those functions are supposed, all those functions of m of k are supposed to agree if you're very close. So maybe a drawing will be in place. I know I have very limited time. So you start with a function phi n. So let's say this is phi n. Suppose this is phi k. Suppose this is phi m. For the sake of the argument, suppose that this came earlier, this came later. So here is the syntactic tree of phi n. Up to, up to this part of the syntactic tree, so am, up to am, all the functions phi, fn, fk, and fm agree. So in particular, they have to agree on phi m and phi k with the previous function that was defined for phi m. But notice that those functions were supposed to preserve syntactic structure. So that f of phi n fn of phi n equals fn of phi k, which fn of phi n, this is supposed to be phi k, fk of phi k, this is supposed to be fm of phi n. Well, okay, but this is f of phi n, this is f of phi k, This is f of phi m. So the diagonal limit will make it agree. OK, uh, I know I have two minutes, so I'll be rushing, but uh, it's it's not a long rush. Uh, I, think, I think you can take about 10 minutes. It should be fine. OK, OK, so that, that that's, that's fine. Okay. In 10 minutes, I can. I, well, of course, skipping all the details, but I can actually really present the argument. So now we only have to, okay, so uh, if this argument wasn't clear, then I assure you it's something that you can like kind of assure yourself in five minutes. This, this is nothing deep. The point was those functions were preserving syntactic structure and kind of they were all in agreement. 
So now it's enough to construct actually construct the required sequence. So the required functions. So suppose you already have f0 up to fn and a0 up to an, and you want to define an plus one and fn plus one. Now consider the following relation. It's kind of, I mean, to me, it was kind of subtle. So you take formula of n plus one, you consider it syntactic tree up to an plus one, you consider whatever subformula you can find here, and now you take the relation of being direct subformula, but you take transitive closure only within that set. So in particular, maybe it happens that here you have a formula psi and here you have formula eta, such that actually eta is a subformula of psi, but this is not witnessed by a chain here in this set. So it can happen that actually, if you would to be, if you were supposed to take the full syntactic tree of psi, then somewhere down here you'll find eta, but here, so it doesn't interest you. So actually in this relation, it's not below psi. On the other hand, it might happen that if you go up to the level a n plus one with a chain of subformula, you hit a formula let's say zeta, and actually you find zeta somewhere here. So in this case, you are allowed to look. So you take paths. It doesn't have to be a path of instances, but you are only taking those paths as long as you stay within trees, right? So maybe once more, but because like this is kind of a crucial point. So you take a sub formula here, C, you continue. At some point, you hit the minimal formula like in that tree, but this formula, like say eta, for some strange reason, it happens to be also here. It can be, right? You follow the path, you take some zeta. Zeta happens to be somewhere here for some reason. Okay, you follow the path, you take some psi. Psi happens to be here. You take its subformula. So now, this psi is below psi, even though it's not literally below it on the picture. So if you would go farther, you would find it. So you go farther, but only as long as you can reconstruct the whole path within the subtree. So this is just repeating what I said. So as the formula is smaller than another, there is a chain of formulae which are all close to phi n plus one, and they are direct subformed. Okay, now notice that you want to define a formula which preserves syntactic operation. You want to define a function which preserves syntactic operation. Okay, so it's literally enough to define it here on the minimal subform, on the subformula that appear here. Not all of those formulae will actually be minimal in this relation, because as I said, it may happen that somewhere here we find psi, which is also here. So you actually to see how psi is defined, you have to consult how it's minimal, how its root is defined. But some formula appearing at this level will be minimal. And actually you have only to care about how you define f of those formulae, because then you just, extend it upwards in the unique way so as to preserve syntactic operations. So you only care of minimal form. I'm using this word semi-minimal here, which for technical reason, the technical reason being that a formula can have two subformulae, one of them is minimal, the other is nothing, you have to decide what to do then, but this is of course technicality I won't get into. So you only have to define the function to define it on a set, you only have to define it on minimal formula in that set. So fix a formula phi n plus one. Consider the templates appearing at the syntactic depth a n. 
ای انفلاسیون If some of them is minimal, no, uh, no, no, no. Okay, no, no, so now's the, uh, now's the crucial, crucial observation. So consider those formulas, which appear at the level a n plus one. I will say in a minute what a n plus one is. Some of them. are in I. Some of them are in M, but not in I. Now, now consider the function that takes formulae appearing at a n plus one. They are at most a two to the n plus one of them. And for each i, it gives you the i formula here. So this is like psi 0, this is psi 1, this is psi 2, this is psi 3, and so on. So enumerate those functions, those formulas. By semi-regularity, all the formulas which appear at the level a n plus 1 or a n for this matter, but this is actually a typo. So if you give me formula phi n plus one, the formula from i, which appear here, I either very small or really, really big. Right, so my regularity says in particular that the syntactic structure of the formula really looks like this. That a big formula at a low level has either very small subformulae or really, 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 really big with nothing in between. Okay. But for reasons which I now finally understand, I didn't understand. This is how we set a n plus one. And for the reasons I won't be able to probably convince you to take. But let me just take how you construct the function, actually. So take the minimal subformulae. Essentially, if it's something that already appeared, that already was taken care of, So this is phi m plus one. You consider a subformula occurring on this depth. So either the formula already appeared in the domain of some previous function, and then essentially you preserve the previous function. So don't, don't uh, care too much. Or not, or it's genuinely new. If it's new, like so this is phi m plus one. If it's new, I know that if it is in I, then actually it's below B. So I just brutally cut it at BM plus one and plug in zero equals zero for everything that appears after this moment. This is an operation which is uniformly arithmetically definable. So it makes sense. And by semi-regularity, it doesn't affect formulae which actually are in I. So you will completely mess up with some formulae, but not not to, well, not with the ones with in I. So if it's not taken care of yet, and it's minimal in the occurring at the level a n plus one, you substitute zero equals zero for everything below b n plus one, which is the level at which no formulae from I can appear. And then in the next four slides, you actually check that with this bounds, and this procedure as we described it with all the details swept under the rug, 
this whole construction yield you this uh, kind of coherent sequence of choices of functions mimicking syntactic structure of big formulae and small formulae, which I think means that my 10 minutes, my time is up. So this moment at which I can really thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. It's really always a great pleasure to talk to this audience. Okay, uh, thank you, Varta. Thank you. I'm sorry, I know it was kind of rushed, more rushed than I was hoping for. Um, so uh, I see Ken has his hand raised, so I'll, I'll go to Ken for, for questions first. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, there's the people like Laurie Kirby have done work with you. You change the language instead of using the usual piano arithmetic, use functional formulation or whatnot. And of course, you can think of hereditarily definable sets, that sort of thing. Uh, finite, hereditarily finite sets. Uh, HDO just snuck in there. I'm sorry for that. Mm -hmm. But um, what what would happen here if you sort of shifted the the language and the formulation. I mean, will that set theory get easier or harder or um, mm -hmm. transitive closures and all these things? Would those arguments simplify or would they? With, uh, so we're trying to what? To, to, change to, pure, to formulate purely in theoretic language or because I'm not sure what kind of, what kind of uh, language I'm, change you have in mind, I'm sorry. Um, so instead of arithmetic, think, do, do some set theory. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so those combinatorial arguments wouldn't simplify, huh. actually, as a matter of fact. Actually, in set theory, you know, like in full set theory, you have a problem with not having end extensions, right? Yeah, but, um, okay. But a, a set theory that's equivalent, say, to piano arithmetic. Okay, so if you if you take like this finite formulation of set theory with anti-infinity axiom and yeah. say epsilon induction, then the arguments will be roughly at the same level of ah. of complexity. No, no, like it, it doesn't. So complexity here is really due to control of the combinatorics of syntax, of formula. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Roman, go ahead. Uh, yes, I, I raised my hand too. Uh, but so my, my, my question is similar to Ken's, uh, in, in a sense that, and I was, you know, it was hard to follow the details, but I understand, you know, this all works nicely. But I was thinking it reminded me in spirit of, of Jim's proof of K KL theorem. When when you just remove all the sort of logical elements, sort of mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter what the structure of the sort of templates is, you know, where are the ors or ends and when the quant you just you just need some you, you reconstruct the sort of a similar <laughs> structure in the in the end extension that's sort of based on some information of what's happening on the cut so i just wondered if, if the proof cannot be simplified somehow maybe even dramatically if you just abstract this somehow that you know like yeah, we, in jim just has this like, like one boolean connective rather than rather than two and so the, the tree the structure of the tree doesn't really matter but you're reproducing something and it and it may may perhaps be something mm, that general. sounds very reasonable. I think that sounds very believable. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think that's a very good uh, that's a very good suggestion that you could that that under simplification. Like uh, I think you, you, you still would run into this basic combinatorial problem with uh, some irregular cuts simply because you know like if you have... at some at some point you need some estimates. You know how these things branch and and sort of. Uh -huh. So eventually, some combinatorics is needed, but maybe it can be somewhat. It, it's really as it shouldn't mm -hmm. depend on on the particular choice of language. Yeah, but I think it's a good, 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 like very. I think it's a very interesting remark to be considered that you can really think make it cleaner. Mm -hmm. I guess. The 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 Jim's construction is very interesting. It's it's a little bit tricky to to modify um in in the way that it's 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 it's, it's a little bit tricky to, to use in in to to sort of you know to change to in 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 in, in, in any other way um but it 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 is a very nice sort of abstraction um so uh i wanted to ask uh 
so uh, or just to see if i understand things correctly that once you've uh, started so you, you you you've started with these sort of um approximations of these mappings of the of the syntactic templates to to try and kind of get it under uh, under this cut eye um what once you've done that then the result uh, is immediate you know because you just um, define satisfaction on the whole model um, as just sort of saying, what is the map? You know, yes, is, yes, is, yes, is yes, assignment yes. True? Okay. Yeah. And yeah, you have, yes, you have. And there's no issue. Yeah, there's no issue with the with the assignments that. Um, I mean, like it would be an issue, but then you have to like check why we went into the plates, right? Why we did mm -hmm. all the technical details, which you did, okay. did not discuss. The, the potentially there, like there is some potential. For, for for there being issues, but you actually kind of they're they're taken care of. Okay. And they're not essential. Like they're, they're kind of new right. Okay, very nice. Any other questions or discussion? Yes, I go ahead. I was wondering now that you've solved collection, is there some stronger axioms beyond induction and collection we could think about adding some kind of combinatorial? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, like uh, we've been normally do, dealing with uh, with axioms suited like suited for true theories. So axioms, for example, like all propositional tautologies are true, and there is like non-trivial uh, issue whether those axioms are cons conservative. Uh, at this moment, I haven't thought of other uh, classical combinatorics taken from PA, but I think it's a very good, very interesting direction, right? Like collection was simply the first thing to, like the first obvious uh, goal. But if you have any like suggestions of other kinds of this classical combinatorics that you have a hunch could be um, like reasonably translatable to the context of true theories that would be very interesting. I think yes, I think it's a very good question. And the answer is we haven't thought, I, I haven't thought about it. Okay, anything else? So uh, uh, on that line, before before I close it, I'll say, uh, so this isn't exactly a combinatorial principle, but you could. Uh, this is something that I thought about, and and you know, I discussed it with Matawi at one point, and we never really made much progress on it. Um, well, or maybe we did, and we just kind of lost it in, in, in at some point. But uh, you know, given a a truth predicate, you can ask which. Uh, what's the longest initial segment of the model uh, of that truth predicate that is coded in the model mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if you know, I, you know as you um you know, you know if it's if it's a model of ct naught then it then then that the whole thing is uh, essentially every initial segment has a code um and and, and that's equivalent to to the the truth predicate being a class right Mm -hmm. Um and so you you could ask that about sort of if it's not if 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 delta not induction fails what is what does that look like and and, and um the thing that is somewhat attractive about that is it seems like you can say something about it, uh, that that perhaps disjunctive correctness is true on that cut um and uh, on that sort of longest coded uh mm -hmm. uh longest initial segment such that each part is coded or piecewise coded is more like that and so there, there's some there may be some interesting um uh sort of truth re theoretic properties of, of that of that sort of cut um you know, uh, that that's something that i thought about a year ago and, and lost at some point uh, mm -hmm. i don't think we, we we ever got very far with it okay are, are there any other questions or Discussion items. Okay, so um, let's let's thank Bartek again. Thank you very much for the two uh, week uh, series. It was very nice.
Thank you. It's always great to speak to this audience. It's always very nice. So we have a short break uh, in our schedule. So we'll take uh, the next couple of weeks off and then we will resume on April 18th uh, with uh, Kasia Kowalik, Kowalik, I should say, um, a student of Leszek uh, Kowodzicek from Warsaw. And I will be taking some time to practice my, my Polish some more. So. <laughs>